Gary, thank you for the question. The eGIFs are um, badges online that you can put onto your profile so that everybody in Globe can see the participation and the wonderful work that you've done. So it's a, an eGIFT um, badge that you can just put onto your profile. We have a couple more people joining us. Um, if you can hear me, please type in if you haven't already. We're still waiting for Sarah. Sarah, I haven't heard from you yet. I don't know if you can hear. Okay, if you can hear me, please type into the, the chat that you can hear me. And one more reminder, if you have not voted, please let us know if you've gotten your e-gift for participating in the SCRC. The, the vote is up at the top. Great. Hearing from a lot of people that you can hear. Um, we're waiting for about one or two more people. And the votes have gone up to yes for uh, two, two people that have gotten the e-gift for the SCRC. That's wonderful. Glad to hear that. Um, okay. Let's get started. Okay, just a second. Okay, my name is Kristen. I'm a project manager here at Globe. And today we have um, Dixon Butler that will do the presentation. Um, just a few things before we begin. Um, technical notes. Type all your questions into the chat window. Um, Travis and I will answer any questions that you have and at the end of the presentation if you have questions specifically for Dixon he can answer it at the end once he's he's finished talking in his presentation. Um, remember to make sure the speaker is icon is above is enabled. It should be green. Um, and check your volume levels by selecting adjust speaker volume. Um, the audio and video has only been enabled for presenters during the webinar, so only I or Dixon will be able to um, talk. So anything you have, please please type it. Um, and if you have trouble connecting or lose a connection and need assistance throughout the webinar, um, please email climatecampaign at globe.gov. Okay, so um, I think that's everything. Now we're going to have Dixon Butler, the former chief scientist at Globe, um, make the presentation. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you so much. Good morning or whatever time of day it is. I guess for some of you, I know it's afternoon. Uh, it's nice to be with you in this wonderful electronic way. We're, let me give you a little bit of an overview of this webinar. Um, there'll be a fair amount in it about the Globe inquiry model. Uh, and that's not some radical departure from what everybody would view as an inquiry model for the scientific research process. The key focus today is on developing a research question, what makes a good research question, things to avoid, and um, a introduction to a research question worksheet that we are providing online. And then at the end, we have some review of important dates coming up for the student climate research campaign. So, Scientist Skills Webinar Series. This is the first in three in a series of three webinars that are about building scientist skills. This is a key part of phase two of the st student climate research campaign. The next two, the dates are shown on the slide. What they're intended to do is help teachers and help students prepare to do real student research, research projects using GLOBE data and preferably using data 
or ideas that come as part of participation in the student climate research campaign. As members of the GLOBE community, teachers and presumably their students have been trained in how to collect GLOBE scientific data and how to enter it into the GLOBE database. That's a key part of the scientific process, but when it comes to actually conducting a research investigation, there's some other steps that need to take place. They come both before, during, and after you take observations and collect data. So this model is available online in the student zone. You'll notice it starts with GLOBE, is symbolized by our GLOBE icon. But then this is really, a, if you will, a cartoon, but it's also, you'll also notice it's a loop. The arrows go around. Now, I'll also have to say that in real practice, People often go hither and yon across this. They uh, might observe nature, pose some questions, develop a hypothesis, plan an investigation, and say, oh, there's a problem with my plan. I need to revise my question or change my hypothesis a little to make my plan doable. Uh, in the process of assembling data, one might trip across something that might be a refinement of a question or a question that you decide is more interesting to you. So just because there aren't lines and loops all over the place, don't assume that you have to go sort of linearly and slavishly through the steps just in this order. Scientists don't do that. Today, as you'll notice, this top right-hand block is the one we're focusing on the most. <clears throat> so how to get there? You'll see the student zone. If you, go to, if you go to explore science right there in the menu bar in the middle of our homepage, you'll see you can highlight the student zone. And when you go to the student zone, you see be a scientist. And so if you click on be a scientist or click on be a scientist up at the top, what you'll get is this page about being a scientist. And then you'll notice we've underlined here steps in the scientific process right there. And that takes you to the page with the cartoon I showed on it, the uh, image of the scientific research pro process. An idealization, but we think a very useful one. Here we go. Dixon? Yes. Just a second. We have a comment that your audio is a bit broken up. Um, Rick, can you please type and let me know that you can hear it again? OK. Sorry about that. Let's Terrific. continue then. Sounds like it's fixed. All right. Very good. Hallelujah. Sorry about that, Rick. So today, our focus within this process is really on posed questions. And this is often the biggest challenge that students encounter, or for that matter, that scientists encounter, how to come up with a good question. So let's talk some more about that. It's where you begin. But then the question is, where do you begin? Uh, I added the phrase to this. I wonder, because your wonder, that also may be a way that we think of it happening with younger students, that, that they're confronted with the world and they wonder about things. Uh, that's really where you start. And after you've observed the environment around you, brainstorm questions you wish to investigate. What could they be? What are some things that interest you? Then you need to identify one or more questions that and here I can't stress this enough, interest you. In my career as a science manager, I've seen people make major contributions and achieve really great careers in science and very helpful research who perhaps weren't the smartest scientist within a field, um, but what made all the difference was they really wanted the answers to their research investigations. They wanted to know, they wanted to figure out, they were motivated, interested, and therefore they were fully engaged. Whereas some other people might have been working on a problem because, eh, well, it's just out there or I could get funding to pay my salary or whatever other motivation it was. But if you can crack through and work on a problem whose answer you want, whose answer you value, and the understanding you gain is something you want to achieve, then it's not just a school assignment anymore. It's not just a have to do. It becomes a want to do. 
and things really, you know, I think you'll find that is a very freeing and empowering thing for everybody. Now, some practical things. It needs to be a question that can be answered. And in practical terms, that means either you've got available data or with GLOBE measurement techniques, or perhaps other techniques that you've learned through GLOBE, you can gather sufficient data or ask perhaps some collaborators, perhaps even at other schools, to gather some data that will enable you to answer the question. So you need to be able to get your hands on the data to answer the question. The other thing about it is, alas, the clock is always ticking. Can you get to an answer? Can you accomplish a, your research project in a reasonable amount of time, in the amount of time consistent with the amount of time available to you? And as it says here, remember I said before, you don't just slavishly go through that circle um, of the scientific research process. I'm going to try and go back to that slide just for a second. At any point in this process, as it says on this bullet, revisit these questions about are you still interested but more importantly can you get to the answer and have you got enough time to get there brainstorming questions you wish to investigate so how to get that process going will you think about what you have seen or measured here's some questions i might ask myself was anything unusual did I see anything that surprised me? Did something seem out of the ordinary? Was I surprised? Can I explain everything I saw or measured? Does it all or already make sense to me? And if you were out there with other students, did everybody see things in the same way? Did anything you observed trigger an argument or a discussion? Those arguments and discussions between different observers are a good way to judge a question that's probably worth investigating and answering. If you went to the same place again, what changes would you expect? If you went to a different place, how would you expect it to be different? In Earth science, in studying the Earth and its global environment, and even the local environment, time and place are the key variables. They're the key things that we change. We can't take the Earth into a laboratory. We can't even take our, our the surroundings of our school, our, our globe measurement site, into a laboratory. Our laboratory is outside. Our laboratory is the world. And we can't, we don't get a spare world to hold as a control and only put a change into one of them. So we have to look at how things change through time and over and from place to place to get at what's going on, to get at an understanding, to get at a scientific testable hypothesis. Okay? Answering question. Again, I come back. It helps if you care about the answer. It's also worth noting that if your classmates would care about the answer, they'll be more interested and supportive of you uh, and more interested in what you have to say at the end. What do you think the answer might be? The key test of that is also how many answers are possible? It's good if there's more than one, one possible answer to your question. Will it take, how long will it take, or excuse me, what will it take to answer the question? So key here is Going back to that question, that point earlier, do I have the equipment? Do I have everything I'll need to get to the answer to my question? Is there more than one way to get there? Scientists are often looking, and mathematicians in particular, are often looking at how can I get to the end? How can I get to the question? Is there more than one technique? Is there an easier way to get there, a more practical way to get there? Will it be easy or hard to get to an answer? And that doesn't mean you should shy away from what's hard and only go with what's easy, or you should only go with what's hard and never go with what's easy, but you should keep that in mind. How good do you need to be to answer the question? You know, you don't want to go on a race for uh, whatever it is, let's say a four-minute 
a 1500 meter race, if you know you can only run a, a 1500 meter race in five minutes, you don't want to be on the track with these other people. You want to be out there where you can actually get to the finish line in a reasonable time and, and account yourself well. So are you up to it? That also can have to do with, do you have the knowledge? Is it going to ask you to do something in mathematics with which you're unfamiliar? And if so, do you have time or can you get help to learn and get to the answer? So what help or equipment do you need to get to the answer? Here with equipment, we mean measuring devices, but it could also be computing equipment, etc. Can you do it? And how long is it going to take? So those are all questions. They somewhat overlap, but questions to ask yourself about answering a question. Here's some qualities of a good research question. A question that poses a problem worth solving. That's straightforward. A question that forces you to evaluate evidence and compare different possible answers. Here we get into, you remember that process we showed is going to go through analysis of the data. Well, if, if you don't need any analysis, you're not really getting through much of a scientific process. It's the thinking that you're bringing to the problem. You're coming as an observer, well, a questioner, but also an answerer. And you need to base your answers on the evidence you found. It takes real work to get to an answer, certainly to a problem that is worth solving. Most of the easy ones have already been answered. So it helps again if it's of interest to you. It also helps if it's of interest to others because it helps you if you're going to stand up and present your research which is the last thing you should do, is be presenting your research to others. Well, it's an important measure of can you interest them? Is your research of interest? Now, that's not absolutely required. There are, the history of science is full of examples of people who went out and studied something that nobody else was interested in, and then what they found was fundamental, important, profound, and drew the interest to it. So it's OK to go out if, if it's only of interest to you initially. But in the end of the day, the problem should eventually be of interest to others. A good research question must be practical as well. You've got to be able to answer it in the time available. And you've got to lay your hands either through taking data or getting access to the data others have, have taken to the data required to answer the question. I'm inclined at this point to tell a, a little anecdote about my, um, the man who was my thesis advisor when I was getting my PhD. And one of the things I remember his saying is the eh, difference between really good scientists and so-so scientists is not that they don't think up questions and problems. It's that the good scientists know which ones are worth the time to do the research. It seemed like a pretty, a pretty fundamental piece of advice and one that I would stick by to this day. Things to avoid. Avoid a question with a simple yes or no answer. A good research question should have more than one answer. Avoid a question that could easily be answered by looking it up in a book or on the internet. You're not trying to just do something that whatever your search, your answering, your favorite answering service has already got taken care of. The answer to a good research question should not be immediately obvious. And it's better to avoid questions whose answer depends on just one or two missing facts. So that you go out, you, with a minimal of effort, you get to one fact and that answers the question. Now, the definition of a missing fact can be somewhat elastic. Uh, a missing fact that requires you monitoring some environmental variable over a period of time that's available to you, that's pretty important. Uh, and if you view that as just one fact, well, that's OK. Um, a couple of facts, well, but if getting at each of them, you know, in other words, each of them isn't just a single measurement or a, 
oh, I saw this on that day. That's what we mean by avoiding questions that depend on just one or two missing facts. A good research question goes be, you to, requires you to go beyond existing explanations, or it perhaps it completes or adapts existing explanations for phenomena or a place. And often in GLOBE, that's what will be the case, is there may be some general statement about there usually such and such happens, but does it happen where you are? Is that usual rule, that normal explanation, does that actually work? Or are you located in a place that's an exception? And if so, why? So here's a worksheet to evaluate questions. The idea is these are things to, to answer. And basically, if the answer is yes, for instance, the answer is not immediately obvious. It's the answer to that is yes, you put a one under the points, and then you total the points, and you see what you get to. The more points, the better the question in general. So this is to give you some help in evaluating your question. It also can be a help, and we'll show you an example in a moment, of the way it can help you refine a question. Take a question and change it, maybe not in a radical way, but change it slightly and get to a better question because of the way you pose it. So to get to this form, again, you'd go to, we're still in the student zone, steps in the scientific process, pose questions. If you were looking at the diagram, you could just click on the pose question circle, I believe, and get there. I think that link is working. So pose questions. Use a worksheet. There you see it. What circled is what we're talking about on this worksheet that you just saw. So let's take an example. Is there a relationship between today's clouds and tomorrow's weather? To be fair, in GLOBE, the student would probably start off, at least, by asking this question and trying to answer this question for their local school atmosphere site. So let's take a look. The question is not immediately obvious. I would grant you that. There could be more than one answer. The answer is not just yes or no. Well, yes, it is. Is there a relationship or no relationship? That's a yes or no question. So that's a zero. It encourages a new or different view of phenomena. And here, I scored this as a one because it gets you to think about these connections. You're looking for, gee, what, what phenomena can be connecting clouds I see today with weather I experience tomorrow? Narrow in focus so that the necessary research can be done. Well, I'm going to give that a one as well because I'm going to assume, let's say I'm going to, well, I could look at my school's been collecting data for a long time. I could be looking at cloud and weather data for years. If I'm a new school and I want to just do it locally, I might only have weeks to do it. But in general, it's a narrow enough focus. I can look at clouds and the next day's weather multiple times. It's a narrow enough focus. Other people will understand it's pretty clear. Now I skipped the next three explanations because I don't think, well, the first one certainly I don't think is something that most students and teachers would, would know. An experienced weatherman might say, oh yeah, there's an accepted explanation and this tests it, but we're going to skip that one. It completes or adapts an existing explanation, same reason. It goes beyond an existing explanation. If you are not well familiar or readily have access to existing explanations, then you skip the existing explanation questions here. Is it possible to answer in the time available to you? Well, in this particular case, we said, I said yes. Again, it depends on how long, how many days of looking at clouds from one day to weather the next do you want to check out. So you can control the scope to keep it possible to answer within an available amount of time. Certainly, GLOBE gives you measurement equipment and techniques to, to make the observations. Any data required from others is available or can be obtained through collaboration? Absolutely. The GLOBE website 
really provides that and uh, the visualization system helps you identify and find those data. Will sustain your interest for the time required to complete the research? Now, everybody has to answer that one for themselves. But I imagined that I was a student and that it would hold my interest. And does it test my assumptions about the phenomena? Well, let's assume I've made a, an assumption and the assumption is absolutely, the answer is yes. Well, we're going to find out if yes or no is right. So I add it all up. I've got nine points. Now, let's try a slightly different question. How reliable is a prediction of tomorrow's weather based on today's cloud observations? And you'll notice all of a sudden at the bottom here, I've got 10, 10 points instead of nine. What changed? Well, I still skipped the three, the three accepted explanation, existing explanation questions. But what changed was the very first one. It's not, or excuse me, the very second one. There's more than one answer. It's not just a yes, no. I could say, well, the prediction is accurate half the time. The prediction is only accurate in terms of I see cirrus clouds today and I get a rainstorm tomorrow. And that happens 90% of the time. There could be a lot of different ways to which there's an answer. And that really opens it up and makes it a better question. Well, that pretty much is it for the substance of talking about good questions. Just to recount, a lot begins with, is it interesting to you? It goes on through, is it going to require an appropriate amount of work? Do I have the equipment? Do I have the ability? Do I have the time? Is it interesting to other people? And is it got enough depth to it? And by depth here, I mean things like it's not just a yes or no answer. Uh, it isn't just obvious. It, and it matters. So, well, I would say looking forward, but right off the bat, yesterday marked the official launch of phase two of the student climate research campaign. And if you participated in phase one of the campaign, there's an e-gift on the Student Climate Research Campaign website for you. And that e-gift fits right in with the new My Pages that every person with a Globe ID now can have, at least every teacher, and teachers, students as an aggregate can have one as well. But for teachers, it lets you put that special e-gift on your My Page if you participated. This month, is the great global investigation of climate intensive observation period. So this month. So you've got some two-thirds of the month left. Uh, go out there and observe in accordance with the SCRC climate observations. Now, when you do phenology, phenology can happen, phenologic change, the way plants and animals, living things, respond to the seasonal cycle of the Earth that can happen at different times in different places. I mean, you know, when my trees begin to turn color this fall, will be much later than those further north in general, and earlier than they will be south of me, closer to the equator. If I was in the southern hemisphere, you just reverse those directions. So it doesn't make sense to exactly put an intensive observation period at one fixed time. You have to decide when your intensive observation period is, which is to say you want to go do phenology measurements when change is beginning to happen. So you look out and say, okay, I sense that fall is in the air. That's the time to start your intensive ob observing period for, let's say, green down. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere in particular right now, you say, hey, you know, it feels like spring. Start your intensive observation period for bud burst or for green up protocols. Those are included in the phenology component of the student climate research campaign. The calendar competition entries are due on the 30th of September. So you have another 19 days to get them in. October 
will be the intensive observing period for climate and land cover. 2nd of October is the next webinar, and it's a learning how to study climate using GLOBE phenology protocols, and that'll help you prepare for doing the phenology component of the SCRC. And again, the times are given October 3rd, I guess when you go to 00 UTC, you've clicked over to the next day. So thank you for attending today. And if there are questions you'd like addressed by me right now and to type them in, um, I will be glad to try and answer them. I don't see any, but I certainly want to thank you all for attending. I don't see any questions right now. I can wait another minute or two, I think, to see if anyone wants to take a moment to type something in. Well, I see two people are typing right now. Rick has asked, how important is it to rule out alternative explanations? an excellent question. The way I would phrase that is it's important but it's not essential. You could for instance get to a point where you say you know there were let's say three possibilities, three possible explanations and based on my research it is most highly likely that this explanation is correct but I cannot, dis I cannot prove that these other two are wrong yet, and to do that, I would need to do this, that, and the other. So you can advance the, advance the research with an answer that might not get all the way to absolutely ruling out an alternative explanation. It also is true in science that we're often thinking up and uh, discovering more and more can include new ways to explain things that did not occur to us before. So, and I've even seen this, people may come up with an explanation, and that's a good explanation within the current context of what we know. And then somebody goes and makes a discovery that opens up a new alternative explanation that you didn't rule out. Frankly, you didn't even conceive of it. And that, that's part of the progress of science. So you, if you can't absolutely exclude an alternative explanation, don't back off of presenting what you did. But it's a good thing if you can rule out an, ex, an alternative explanation. That's obviously very nice if you can do it. So let's see. The next question came, I believe, from David Brooks. David Brooks has provided you all with a nice link. Okay, and Rick, you're certainly welcome. Uh, Belinda. Belinda asks, what minimum age do you recommend posing research questions, question guidelines such as these? I'm not a wonderful expert on child development or even on the phasing of education through the uh, you know, the primary and secondary grades. My experience tells me that I'm pretty comfortable with everything we talked about today for students who are, I would say, in the United States, we would say fourth grade and above, um, at least roughly nine years old. They have already learned, you know, they're already numerate, they're already literate, hopefully, and they're beginning to have these questions. But there are things within this that I would certainly ask at the youngest of ages. That sense of wonder is something we want to treasure and support that we come with as human beings. You know, I, imagine a child who has no wonder. You, you just don't. Um, it, you, you can't imagine that. The, there is wonder in a child. And we want to support that wonder. So beginning to say, well, what's the question? Could you find the answer? In other words, you'll have to simplify 
the way the discussion went in these charts, but you can get at the essential points. For one thing, hey, a five-year-old, asking a five-year-old to spend a bunch of time working on understanding the answer or getting the answer to a question that is not of interest to the five-year-old is probably not a very good idea. So getting that, capitalizing on their interest, what question would they ask, and helping them say, well, can you see? Could you look? Could we come back tomorrow? Could, and again, you can stick with the observations that don't necessarily require, for a five-year-old, conversion into a number. Now, the buds burst is my always my favorite example of the GLOBE protocol that a kindergartner can provide research quality environmental data. It's a yes-no question for that day. And if you know the day, and with the teacher's help, you know what plant you're looking at. That's scientific data. If you know it, the buds didn't burst yesterday, they were still waiting, and today they burst, that, that's data for this year for the ages. And so if you get to that kind of observation uh, for the test of a question, you can do most of this. Belinda, I know I've run on on that somewhat, but I think that was just a terrific question and is very important because we want students to build their habits of mind for doing research. It's not something we don't expect them to do advanced mathematics in, in kindergarten, or for that matter, for most kids, we don't expect that in primary grades at all. But we do build to where later on they'll have that advanced mathematics within their grip. We want to do the same thing with their skills to think scientifically. Let's see. Donna has asked, where can I find this presentation? Will it be available? And the answer is yes, but I'll have to defer to a written answer So, because um, I think I'll let um, Travis or, or Kristen type an answer to that. And Travis has already done it. Now, I've got a question which I believe is coming from Thailand. I am a globe teacher and preparing a, com a, a comparative on the temperature increase in the past five years. Ah, well, there are two parts to the question. One of them has to do is, and I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm afraid, forgive me, I'm not understanding the question, the first part of the question completely. I don't know if you're saying, what can I do to find people to collaborate, or how can I elaborate and implement a comparative, a com a comparative on temperature increase in the past five years. Several suggestions, probably more than I can answer today. But if you're looking at a five-year temperature record from a globe school, your school perhaps, another globe school, or several different globe schools, and it doesn't have to be just the last five years, but let's say you, you focused on that. If you can get the data together, there are several different ways to look at that data. You could look at it as a graph. If it's for, you know, for a few schools, you could have a graph of their temperature versus day go on. You could compare subsets. So, oh, let's look at July five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, today. That cuts the scope down, may make it more manageable. You can ask your students, what questions? Here's all this data. We got five years of temperature data. We've got maxes, we've got mins, we've got local solar noons. What question would you ask? How would you like to look at the, these data? Do you want to look and compare how our data compare with data from some other place? Do we want to look at how one year compares to the next? Am I looking at how the January versus July comparison has changed from year to year? Am I seeing temperatures that stay more the same, in other words, between my the extremes of seasons than they used to? All of those things are good questions, and they take different paths in terms of looking at the data. 
You're looking at similar data, but you'll look at different sets of it, different subsets of it. And the calculations you may do with it, the averages, uh, even exactly what you calculate, well, those will be different depending on the questions you ask. So I think a key thing is perhaps with your student's help or as a student assignment or yourself, depending on your student level, get the data together or at least get an example from at least one place of these data together. And have the student start by looking at those data. You know, if you look at that chart back on the GLOBE website of the scientific process, it says, basically, look, observe nature. Now, admittedly, we tend to have in mind when we say observe nature, go outside and look. But in this case, you're looking at a set of observations that have been made by others. But you can look at those data to start off and get to what question would I pose. So I hope that's of some help. Now, you mentioned bud burst. There, are glo there is a GLOBE bud burst protocol, and fairly simply, it involves identifying a native plant in your area, one that is not artificially fertilized or artificially irrigated, and also, it needs to be a plant that is at least dormant some of the year. So if you've got a, a spring-like phenomena or a time of the year, it's not always spring in all climates, a time of the year when a plant will, and they put out little buds, sometimes leaf buds, sometimes buds for flowers, but generally leaf buds are there. If you see those buds, and those buds are often there for a long time before they open up, that's what you're looking at. And the protocol gives you steps for observing, if I remember correctly, two at least two buds on at least each of two branches of the plant. And your students look and say, are the buds closed or open today? The buds are closed, you write down closed. And then the day that they open, you write down open. And that's just an important change. And what day that happens, varies and is a measure of climate in most places. Sometimes it's a measure of temperature. Sometimes it's a measure of precipitation, available water for the plant. But it's important climate data. Rick has asked, do you see much value in doing simple comparisons between places? In other words, between GLOBE schools. And I think the answer is yes. Again, this is perhaps a, a question that is dependent on the age and stage and sophistication of the students. So I think for younger students, a simple comparison of just two places is a, is a great way to start out and, and build research skills and is a valid research process, particularly for a younger student. So. It also is a good way to teach some geography. How does the world differ? How do we, you know, it opens the door to so many other things beyond just scientific learning. So I think it is a valid one. If I was dealing with ex more experienced, research confident students as they've matured and learned, learned how to do research, then you want something a little more than just two schools, I would think, uh, a comparison a systematic comparison. So let's say I was looking at, well, I want to look at schools at the same latitude, but at different elevations. Atmosphere sites at the same latitude, but different elevations. It would be good to not just have, oh, I've got one at sea level and I've got one at 3,000 meters. You know, that might be a nice way to start. Maybe I'm 10 or 11. But if I've been doing this since I was 10 or 11 and I'm now 15, you know, it would be good to look at, well, let me get a sample at sea level, let me get a sample at 1,000 meters, a sample at 2,000 meters. If I can find them, a sample at 3,000 meters for the locations of the sites with enough data. And again, all those practicality questions come in. But I think then you, you go beyond the single or, the, you know, just a, a binary comparison of two schools, two places.
David Brooks is getting at the point, and I won't read his whole question to everyone, but is addressing the question of, well, are GLOBE student data really enough to address a climate question? Well, if you're talking about the ultimate kind of climate question that needs 30 years of observations, no. But, you know, there was a day in the 1950s when a man in Hawaii began to measure how much carbon dioxide was in the air. And he had to fight for the research money to keep doing it. And at some point, the responsibility was handed off to his son, another sophisticated and very capable researcher. But because of that, we have the Mauna Loa climate record of carbon dioxide. That record shows an enormous number of things, but it is the iconic re reference that shows us the buildup of carbon dioxide, which is a critical greenhouse gas. And among the ones that are changing profoundly, it's the one we really worry about, and it's the one that seems to be making the biggest difference. So take your data, analyze your data. We're not looking our students doing research that can be published in the Journal of the American Meteorological Society. We're looking for data, and I apologize if you're hearing my phone ring in the background. We're looking for data, and I'm not near the phone to answer it. Um, we're looking for students to learn to do the research process. Are their research thoughts valid? Yes. They can look at the data and they can make conclusions. Are the conclusions they can reach and their generality circumscribed, limited by the data available to them? Absolutely. That's true for every professional scientist, no matter what you're doing. You're limited by the available data. That's why in earth science and the study of the earth, I always say you can't take today's data tomorrow. And you know, and today we can't take yesterday's data. We work very hard to find proxies, ways we can observe something frozen in ice, settled in a sediment, uh, embedded in the growth pattern of a tree that we can use to try and figure out past temperatures, past levels of carbon dioxide, past levels of oxygen in the atmosphere. But today, taking today's data today is clearly the best thing. So. You make your contribution by taking the day's data today. You're learning to think scientifically and do research. So within the data available to you, within the data comprehensible by you, you do your analysis, think through, reach your conclusions. You've done a good job. You've done something of value. Dixon, thank you so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. You're certainly welcome. Glad to do it. Okay, a couple of reminders. Um, please be sure to submit your art by September 30th for the calendar competition. Um, you still have a few weeks to get that. Um, thank you so much, each of you, for participating. This was really engaging and also really good questions, um, which definitely made it really interesting and um, really appreciate that. Um, so remember to bring, put, submit your art. Um, and also, before you leave, if you haven't already, please type in where you're from and also your role within GLOBE, if you're a partner or a teacher um, or how, how you participate with GLOBE. Um, we will have another webinar at Zero UTC on September 12th. Um, and again, thank you so much for your participation. Have a great day.